tonight. I am hoping to talk to you about these plants um, in a in a more storytelling format and talk a little more about um, not necessarily just the needs of the plants, but some interesting facets about their ecological histories and connections and some of their, you know, sociocultural connections and histories. Um, and we are also doing things slightly differently than we have in the last couple of years of the plant sale. This is our third year doing the plant sale. So we'll talk a little bit about that as well. Um, and hopefully if you have any questions about the sale, if this is your first time participating in it um, or anything, um, hopefully we'll address some of those questions. So if I can find my controls, there we go. So, um, as I said, I'd like to share, um, knowledge about these plants in a, in a storytelling format and, um, that conceptualization, at least for me, is something that I have learned from, um, indigenous members of land workers within Toronto, the greater Toronto area, Southern Ontario in general. Um, and I find that that method of learning about things also tends to, to keep some, some aspects of the knowledge around in my head, at least. And so the species that we're going to talk about tonight, um, there's only about 11 of them. They may not be new to some of you, but there is so much nuance to every single species of plant that we are engaging with in this process of habitat creation or you know, diversifying our communities and neighborhoods. Each of those plants have like incredibly intricate stories of not just their ecological impacts, but their connections to people. Because in a lot of circumstances, the plants that are here are here because of people, either accidentally or on purpose and, you know, with some care and intent. And that goes to reflect in the biodiversity that we see around us um, and the type of biodiversity that we're trying to cultivate back into our urban centers. Um, that biodiversity existed in those spaces because there were amazing spots to live in. Um, Southern Ontario is teeming with beautiful, rich shorelines and wetlands and meadows and so many spots that were. Um, <clears throat> so that area is teeming with such rich land and such rich waters um, that trying to cultivate any form of reconnection to, to that sort of what used to be Southern Ontario, these, you know, expansive uh, wetland areas and expansive native, you know, meadows and mixes of, of forest and so on, the closer we can try to get back to that stage, which in urban environments is through native plants, uh, the better. But all of those plants, uh, of which there are so many species, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of species, and every year through this plant sale, and we'll talk about some others, uh, we are able to provide just a sliver of diversity that exists in this vast world of plants. And there is knowledge and knowledge systems that exist around these plants, around their uses, around their names, around their, um, you know, textures and, and all kinds of identifying features. And those stories are what help us keep trying <laughs> to bring back some of that biodiversity, some of that uh, original charm of having dozens of different bee species and dozens of different butterfly species and hundreds of different moth species coming to, you know, uh, a spot of land that now might just be a paved over piece of boulevard. Uh, and so with the stories of all of these plants and the various nuances in mind, um, 
I, you know, always want to acknowledge that um, the biodiversity that I am trying to recultivate my way towards is one that would not have existed here without the ongoing and long-standing stewardship of the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, the Huron, Wendat, and thousands of other people who traded and traversed these lands. Um, and all of the people who are now trying to reconnect with the land in some way, shape, or form that is respectful and reciprocal. So thanks for being here. Let's talk about some plants. Uh, so the sale is currently on. Hopefully, if you're here, you know that you can buy the plants right now. Uh, if you don't know um, or don't uh, have access to the link, um, please email us at admin at projectswallowtail.ca. Uh, you may not be on our newsletter list for some reason, but if you're here, you're most likely on our newsletter list. And um, the sale is taking place online. Uh, the final day for placing all orders will be May 24th. Um, and then pickup will be in person on May 28th, 2023, which is a Sunday. Uh, and it will take place this year at Allen Gardens. And um, we have had requests from folks, as we have in previous years as well, uh, about the possibility for delivery of plants. Um, and unfortunately, we don't have dedicated staff or capacity to, to offer delivery. Um, however, we do ask for volunteers from the project who are coming to pick up plants and see if they would be able to uh, transfer plants back to their own neighborhood or maybe drop something off on the way back to their home. Uh, and so in the last couple of years, as people have needed it and as people have volunteered, we've typically been able to connect folks with, uh, with eager volunteers who are able to shepherd their plants over to them. Um, but it is not always a guarantee depending on where you live or depending on the number of folks who are uh, able to, to contribute their time to transfer those plants. So uh, pick up in person, either yourself or through someone else who might be able to pick up on your behalf um, will, is, is ideal on Sunday, May 28th uh, from between 12 p.m. to 4 p.m. And all you need to pick up the plants is uh, the or the last name of the person who placed the order. Um, and we will have your entire, your, your, your order in our list. Uh, and we will simply, we'll, we'll know exactly what you placed an order for unless you change your mind on the spot. And unfortunately we do not or will not have capacity to take purchases on the spot. Um, all of the plants that will be there will will be reflective of pre-purchases that have been made online. Uh, and so Allen Gardens is at 160 Gerard Street East. Uh, we will receive reminder newsletters uh, as we get closer to it. Um, the plants are uh, getting ready. <laughs> the The nursery is extremely busy. And uh, I, I'm always, you know, I'm always slightly nervous, but uh, also excited. So uh, just like the last two years, for those of you who may have been around or may have participated in a previous uh, plant sale, uh, we offer the plants in kits, um, in uh, sun and shade kits, depending on the um, uh, depending on the uh, environment of your habitat. And uh, however, this year we don't have two different sizes. Uh, in previous years, we had small kits and large kits. The small kits had seven plants, the large kits had 10. However, we found that that ended up being uh, sort of a waste of plastic in that um, the trays are only made for 10 plants at the very least. And so that extra bit of empty space just meant that there were there were a lot more trays being used uh, unnecessarily. Um, and uh, the difference between seven and 10 didn't seem that huge. And so this year we streamlined it to two sizes, uh, still sun and shade kits, but there are just 10 plants per kit. Uh, and the plants have been chosen with the intention to have um, bloom periods that kind of spread uh, over 
the uh, three flying seasons of pollinators. Um, and the price has changed from previous years. Um, uh, and that is due to uh, a reduction in the grant funding that we had received to provide these plants at uh, heavily subsidized rates. However, the cost currently, uh, thanks to the wonderful partnership of Pollen ATO, is still the below, or the price is still below the cost that we paid for the kits. And so they're $23 for 10 plants. Uh, the hope is still to make them as accessible as possible, uh, but we will we'll have to sort of reassess this model of uh, sorry, my cat is crying. If you can hear that, um, reassess this model of of the plant sale in future years because I think we have some really cool um, other opportunities as well. Um, and so, what you will get uh, is these plants. The um, kit descriptions also have been shared by a newsletter um, and. We will put them on the Project Swallowtail website so you can access them on there. Uh, in previous years, we had um, we had printed uh, or we had we had paper copies of the uh, of the sheets. Uh, however, this year to save on paper because I still have uh, like 140 of last year's sheets and still sheets from the the first year <laughs> um that uh it's um it, it's preferred for me to not waste that much paper <laughs> and so uh they're going to be online um we will have some copies available in person in case you forgot for some reason what it was that was in each kit uh, but um they will be online and they've been once again beautifully designed this year uh, by Douglas Counter, which is super awesome. Uh, he designed our uh, kit information sheets last year. Um, and so what I will not be covering uh, in tonight's talk is all the information that Douglas has already beautifully uh, designed and synthesized in these sheets. And that is information like what kind of soil these plants need, what kind of sun conditions these plants need, what kind of pollinators they might attract, um and the the bloom periods they have the flower color the heights that they might get to uh all of that information is summarized in these sheets for you uh tonight i am hoping to talk a little bit more about the uh the the stories of the plants um and so the two final things i want to cover before we get into the individual plants uh of tonight is the uh, model this year of uh, the planted forward kits, which are essentially kits that you can purchase that will go towards uh, a community project that did not receive funding or did not have enough funding to, to get plants to enhance pollinator habitat or to incorporate into projects that they were looking for. And thank you to everybody who already made those purchases. I don't know if they're here, uh, I don't know if they will watch this later, but if they do, thank you, uh, because um, we we now have some plants to offer partners who already had reached out and we had already sort of had discussions around trying to provision plants for them. Uh, and so this is kind of an experiment. This is the first year we're doing it. Uh, and if, you know, if it seems uh, feasible as a, a feasible method of getting community groups plants, um then that's great however if we find that it doesn't meet the need that folks have then we'll have to revisit this and figure out other ways to to provide folks with plants uh so the connections between the planted forward kits are kind of made on an as needed basis although the number of kits that have been purchased so far are kind of uh really great because they fulfill um uh, a few community project needs uh, already. Um, so that being the stop uh, in Toronto, the Black Farmers Collective. Uh, sorry, one second. My cat is trying to rip my door apart. Okay, I'm back. Uh, the Black Farmers uh, Community uh, community uh, in Downsview and also a couple of Block Ambassador projects. So if any of the Block Ambassadors are here, um, that 
have reached out with requests for plants. There are a couple of kits that we have set aside for those. Um, and then Pollinate TO, once again, this year, uh, super excited to be partnering with Pollinate TO. And so if you are a Pollinate TO grant recipient, you will be receiving one free plant kit uh, of your choice on the day, because uh, we will have all the kits there. Um, you will need your group name, uh, and we will have our Pollinate TO staff will be there. So you will hopefully recognize them. Uh, if not, then uh, you'll definitely see the signs. Uh, you'll get a garden sign, a Pollinate TO garden sign for, for each of the groups. Uh, and then if, as a Pollinate TO group, you have also made additional kit purchases, that information won't be with the Pollinate TO crew. That information will be with the uh, Project Swallowtail slash me crew. Um, because those purchases will have gone through the, the Eventbrite system that we've set up at Project Swallowtail rather than uh, what we've set up with Pollen ATO for the free kit. So uh, hopefully that makes sense. And obviously there will be folks there on the day of the sale if you have any questions. Uh, so please check your emails uh, ahead of time, your junk, spam, trash, whatever. Um, your all mail, which is a weird category in Gmail that goes uh, unseen sometimes. Um, and uh, all of that information will will be shared with you. And so let's jump into some sun plants. So we're going to talk about the, the species that are in the uh, sun plant kit. And it's... I'm particularly excited because I got to relearn a bunch of things about a lot of these plants that I, you know, uh, think I know, but really, you know, how much do we really know? And so uh, we're starting off with a species that I think would probably seem um, very common to uh, a lot of the folks here, probably a lot of the folks who have done uh, any bit of gardening or um, paid you know, spend enough time in somebody's flower full garden um, is brown eyed Susan. And so you'll notice that I uh, put the Latin name up first and that's because brown eyed Susans is, are one of those uh, native plants that have an exceedingly large amount of cultivars. Um, and that just means that the, the original plant has been bred to, uh, to fulfill certain different color palette and branch thickness and other desires um, into a hundred different ways. And so typically uh, if you find brown eyed Susans at a nursery, they are often not the uh, wild ecotype or the native ecotype. Um, they'll often be some kind of cultivar, uh, some kind of um, uh, alternate version of the original. And, the the easiest way to figure out whether the the species you are looking at or the individual of of brown eyed susan you are looking at is a cultivar or not is if they have the scientific name listed then and it's a Rebecca herda then that is the the original ecotype but in a lot of cases nurseries may not have the scientific name and so uh, typically the even in the common name, they'll have something like brown-eyed Susan sunburst or brown-eyed Susan mist, whatever. There are truly like, you know, over like 60 different kinds. So they have all kinds of names, uh, but they'll typically have some sort of uh, uh, additional, you know, quote name uh, with the brown-eyed Susan. Um, however, that's again, not always the case. Maybe you're at a nursery that just has brown-eyed Susan, and then it can be quite hard to figure out whether it's a, uh, a you know, a, a native ecotype or, um, uh, or a cultivar. Uh, but the, the native ecotype is, uh, in its, in its growth can get quite, um, bushy, uh, over years. Uh, not that the individual plant itself is bushy, but that, um, they they tend to kind of <laughs> to, to to twirl around and figure out their own interesting weird ways of of going up to the sun and they can end up per, you know producing patches that are a little leggy and and falling over uh, depending on what kind of condition they're growing in. Um, 
And one of the things that I personally like about the brown eyed Susans is that in at this time of year in the spring, if you have brown eyed Susans in your yard or in, you know, an overwintering pot or some kind of container garden, um, it's really satisfying to sort of feel the texture of the leaves. If you're seeing any early leaves at this time of year, just kind of popping up because brown eyed Susan leaves are really fuzzy. Uh, and so it, it's a very satisfying kind of, you know, identifier you're like oh great i know something about plants that's the that fuzzy fuzzy little tiny leaf uh not prickly like uh or you know prickly and and pointed that's you got thistle uh we're talking we're talking about rounded little fuzzy leaves um almost like mullen or lamb's quarter if you're familiar with those plants um and the cool thing about uh, the brown-eyed Susans, and there, this applies to the aster family in general, uh, is that the, the 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 rays or the individual petals, kind of what that that you see on the flower head, um, act like runways. So there are in UV light, there are these pathways that essentially guide pollinators right to the center of um the 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 flower where the goods are where the flower needs the pollinator to go in order for it to reproduce uh and so that applies to uh brown eyed susans just as well and uh the types of pollinators that uh arrive on brown eyed susan or like brown eyed susan the most uh happen to be the the genus helictus or uh sweat bees uh and also, the pearl crescent butterfly uh, um, seems to prefer it for nectaring. Uh, it's not a host plant for it, uh, but it does prefer it for nectaring. So it's a cool, uh, it's a cool addition to to any new pollinator patch. I would say because it is such a familiar flower. It is a flower that has been cultivated so much that it exists in most, you know, even well-maintained <laughs> uh, gardens. Um, and because of the familiarity, it can be kind of uh, a bridge species <laughs> if you happen to be creating habitat somewhere um, that is sort of new. If you're creating, I don't know, a boulevard habitat on a, on a, on a street that hasn't seen it before, uh, this is a species that is very familiar and, you know, attracts attracts things that um, are are mostly uh, like w wasps are not really visiting Rubecchia herta. There are some flowers that, you know, wasp species will visit, but uh, mostly uh, brown-eyed Susan appeals to a lot of butterflies and, and sweat bees. And uh, next up is blue stemmed goldenrod, uh, which we will not have this year. Unfortunately, um, so uh, we work uh, this year. We are working with Grow Wild Nurseries in Omimi, Ontario, and you know, nurseries deal with a whole myriad issues uh, every single year: pests and uh, fungal outbreaks and floods and uh, tornadoes. Last year, they they got a lot of damage um, from that spring windstorm. Um, to greenhouses and things. Anyway, um, I am not, I am not certain what the uh, cause of the blue stem goldenrod demise was this year. Uh, however, I do know that it may be swapped with another goldenrod species. Go, uh, Grow Wild is is working out their logistics of, um, you know, they have hundreds and hundreds of large scale orders, so. They're, they're starting to figure out what species we can get in the amount that we need them uh, from other orders. So I will know, and as soon as I know, I will let you know. Uh, but it may be swapped with another goldenrod species or more golden alexanders, uh, of which you have some in the sun kit, if you have purchased them or will purchase them. Um, and they bloom like surprisingly early in the spring. They're one of the only uh, yellow early spring flowers. I feel like a lot of early spring flowers are like white or purple or 
I mean, you know, then there's non native like hyacinths and things get like pink and all kinds of other colors. But um, uh, golden Alexanders like really kind of stand out, I feel, uh, other than dandelions, just in that early season yellow. Um, and the uh, once they have bloomed in the spring, uh, it is possible to like to cut. Uh, this once the seed heads are formed to cut the seed heads and you can collect the seeds and you know uh, repropagate it uh, but it's possible for the same plant to then bloom again in the fall uh, it's it, it's a it's a possibility not a guarantee but you're not damaging the plant either don't deadhead all the flowers probably but uh, you know one or two uh, it's a it's a really cool experiment to see if you can get the, the 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 flowers coming back up in the fall um it is a larval host plant for the black swallowtail butterfly um which is a piece of information that you will have on those sheets as well um but the um the interesting thing about this plant is that it it is also part of the carrot family uh it doesn't immediately seem like it but it's if you compare it to uh highly invasive and sort of noxious species called um uh wild parsnip or cow parsnip um you might recognize the sort of familiarity in the flowers but it would be very hard to confuse the two species because a of when they bloom um and also parsnip gets a lot taller a lot bigger a lot bushier golden alexanders are quite um delicate generally speaking and they don't really spread as vivaciously as cow parsnip does either and again cow parsnip blooms in the uh summer and fall rather than in the early spring um and there are at least two species of pollen specialist bees so uh that rely on uh, uh zizia aurea or the golan alexander and uh pollen specialist bees are often um highly overlooked when we're talking about uh enhancing biodiversity on local scales because they are most often some of the smallest species uh and they'll belong to either mining bee or uh sweat bee popular uh, families um and those species do not travel very far at all and so um their specialization on um these uh on very specific groups of flowers makes it so that their populations are even more restricted than other um than other groups of native bees who might be more generalists and um the the two species of pollen specialist bees don't have uh any common names because they're 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 just adrenid uh and helicted species um I uh, I knew their names at some point. They're they're Latin names, but now they're adrenid and helicted species uh, that specialize on golden alexanders. And so, uh, one of the things that I find repeatedly in pollinator habitat creation, in like putting native plants on the ground, is that if you plant it, they will come, uh, and you might not even notice. <laughs> you might not even know that these bees are benefiting from this uh, from this flower, um, but that is who these incredibly tiny, tiny, tiny flowers are made for, are those short-tongued, incredibly tiny bees that specialize specifically on this flower. And so there is, um, you know, not to say that this flower is dependent on just those bees, but those bees are definitely dependent on, on this flower uh, and, and its family. And the uh oh yeah i forgot i had this pop-up in here anyway look at that pop-up black swallowtail that's who hosts on it uh this is uh, uh, uh a uh, caterpillar id book i have the caterpillars of eastern north america it's a really cool resource to see what kinds of species host on the various native plants that you might have in your yard uh even some non-native species actually um but uh that's the black swallowtail caterpillar it's wild, isn't it? Cool looking. Uh, that's one of the morphs, at least. Um, and so we move to common milkweed, probably the species that everyone's like, oh, I know that. Know that so well. No problem. Uh, but did you know that it actually has like a military history? 
and that the milkweed pods, the fluff from it, used to be collected. It used to be like a kind of mild paying job uh, to collect milkweed pods in the late fall and uh, take them to factories that would fill the inner linings of uh, vests for soldiers going off to war in World War I. And weirdly, this same plant, this milkweed, even though it is not, in fact, uh, a weed, the weed, the, the term weed is problematic in its own sense, but, you know, uh, we are we are trying to encourage the growth of all of these native species and having weed in the name really doesn't help. Uh, but this native plant does have a weird connection to a species that, you know, I think fits the, the conventional conception of weed a lot more and that is the uh, highly invasive dog strangling vine and if any of you have experienced dog strangling vine dog strangling vine also produces incredibly uh, abundant amounts of these little uh, pea pod looking things and those pea pod looking things also produce fluff and they were originally brought here dog strangling vine as a plant um, because of their fluff producing ability and for their use in military tech. But once we moved on to bigger and better things and figured out polyester, uh, the plant was just let go and there was noth nothing controlling it, nothing using it anymore. There was no fluff being used. And now it's just, it just spreads as it spreads. Uh, and I've learned from Joseph Bidamwanakwet, who's a Anishinaabe uh, medicine teacher person, uh, that milkweed it makes really good wart medicine. So that actual milk, milky sap, if you've got some warts, you just like put it on there and repeated, repeated treatment will apparently just dry them off and it'll just fall off one day because there is a, there's an acid in that, like, in that, in that substance that will separate your skin cells from the dead skin cells of the wart. That's super cool. Uh, it's, um, one of the few species that benefits quite a variety of pollinators and other species purely because of its nectar and pollen. There are, you know, other plant species that uh, will will be beneficial to birds, let's say, as seed producers. Um, uh, but you know, the birds will not actually come and feed from it. Let's say hummingbirds won't come to. Uh, brown-eyed Susans, because there's no there's no easy spot for them to access the nectar. Um, but they will come to common milkweed. And uh, long-tongue day-flying moths, like the uh, hummingbird clearwing or the snowberry clearwing, can, can visit um, milkweed, butterflies, bees, flies, beetles, ants, like ev everybody can use milkweed. Uh, through the nectar and pollen alone. And the seed pods are not particularly beneficial to anyone. Uh, they used to be to people, and then we kind of stopped using them. However, um, if you were particularly interested, you could uh, uh, get to pickling and eating them. Uh, so I have never done that process, and I would not suggest you undertake it lightly. Uh, the next up is fox glove beard tongue. And I think the the most fun aspect about this plant is why why is it called that? And uh, it's called that. So I thought I knew the story of why it was called this, but apparently there's a parallel story about why it's called this, and I'll share both with you. So the reason that I have understood for why it is called this is the flowers being white and kind of tubular like look like the paw of a fox, which is white. Uh, and the leaves of this plant, which are quite, quite large and not particularly frequent, it's not a very bushy plant, um, are very long, kind of look like a tongue and are very fuzzy on top. And so look like a bearded tongue. So foxglove is the flower, and then beard tongue is describing the, the leaf. Uh, although I learned today 
that the beard tongue might also be describing the particularly dry stamens uh, that are inside of the flower. But I don't know. Uh, both of those definitions kind of make sense for other beard tongues as well, because there are hairy beard tongues, smooth beard tongues. There are others, but they all have hairy leaves. But I, I don't know if they have the dry statement. Gonna assume maybe they do, but if they don't, that's part. The, both of those things are part of this plant story, at least. Uh, and another thing that is definitely part of this plant story is that in the fall, it produces these uh, a very abundant little tiny bald seed heads um, that will eventually explode and spread its seeds in, in your yard and your neighborhood. Um, however, if you pick them before they burst and decide to like pry them open, they kind of smell like cheese. And I don't know, uh, my nieces really enjoyed the cheesy seeds. Kids like weird smells, and they just they got real obsessed with the cheesy seed plant. So they collected a whole bunch of them and wanted to grow more. Uh, my sister is probably not particularly happy about it, but uh, that's fun. Uh, another really cool thing about foxglove beard tongue is that the leaves, um, and this is not just unique to foxglove beard tongue, it applies to um, uh, brown-eyed Susan and other kind of fuzzy leaved plants as well, but foxglove provides quite a, a, a nice <laughs> runway to do this work on. But the leaves are used by uh, megachylid bees, so wool carter bees, which you might see in your yards um, quite often in the summertime, but maybe not recognize. Uh, they kind of look like this guy on the right-hand side of your screen. They have wings that go quite, um, quite angularly out they stick their butt up quite a bit their their butts are a little striped um they they might look like a wasp to you if you weren't paying close enough attention but their bums are quite rounded rather than sharp um and they'll they'll scrape the tops of the leaves with with the front and middle of their legs uh and co and collect that fluff and take it back to their nests to pat it with uh hence their names wool carters it's not really wool but you know they're carding the wool uh, and they are naturalized species, as in they are non-native, or they were at some point, but they're not really, we don't know that they are particularly competing with anybody in a negative way. And so um, they are really cool to observe. And there are other megachylid bees that also use this plant. Uh, and there are also nectar guides on the inside of these flowers, which are super cool because the nectar guides kind of um, are, are purpley. Uh, you can kind of see them at the very tip of this flower here. So they're purple to our eyes, but um, it's it's the reverse color palette if you were to look at it in UV where it's the flower looks kind of purpley and the lines look kind of whiter. So that's cool. Um, and carpenter bees, in order to access the, the, the nectar that's deep in this flower, unlike the uh, megachylid bees and bumblebees who will really work to crawl in there. Carpenter bees just, they don't even bother. They just go to the back of the flower, they'll just cut it open and they'll just drink the nectar out the back, which is, you know, that's kind of, uh, that's a pretty, that's a pretty badass move. Uh, and this plant also has kind of like a very long um, visual appeal <laughs> uh, because it flowers kind of in like uh, early summer, and the 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 leaves they start turning to this really beautiful reddish burgundy color in like late summer and that'll stay with into the fall so it's quite a beautiful plant um sort of throughout the the cycle of your garden and then last up in the sun kit uh is prairie smoke which i think is a species that anybody who uh you know knows a lot about native plants uh excites them um but even if you just saw it in a garden center i think it's a very visually appealing species like the very delicate beautiful flowers uh it is also a member of the rose family and the rose family is so huge that that may not be surprising to you, but it was definitely surprising to me because this is an incredibly understated rose. <laughs> like most roses I know grow 
like very heartily and I don't have to like worry about them year on year. Prairie smoke, once established, can really have like a bumping population, but they are almost endangered. Like they don't have that status, but they are almost there across most of its native range in southern Ontario uh, because they are easily outcompeted. They they kind of like grow, they have populations that, that sort of just expand uh, very centrally rather than kind of rhizomously taking over a, a huge patch. Uh, and development, their their root systems aren't so massive that if you know you took like even a small patch of yard out, that there would be enough left for the next population to sort of continue. Uh, unlike you know many of the you know like goldenrods or other species where even if you were to take away um, some of the soil or some of the the, the previous garden that might have been there, uh, that species is likely to to reemerge. Um, and one of the really cool things about this plant is that, um, again, bees have to really fight to get into it because the flowers are kind of like closed and nodding like that. But uh, they turn upright once they have become pollinated. And once they've become fertilized, the plant, instead of nodding downwards, will turn upwards. And once it turns upwards, it will... Uh, produce its fruit, uh, which are known as achenes. So they're not they're not actually fruit, but it's the fruiting body of the flower uh, or of the plant. Uh, and they're known as achenes or achenes, uh, whatever their pronunciation is. Uh, and that's kind of where these these plants get their name is that wafting um, uh, fruiting body looks like smoke being carried away from the the plant. So prairie smoke. So those are all your plants in the sun kit. Uh, and now we're going to move and talk a little bit about all the different shade species. Uh, so you've got five of them, two of each plant, hopefully easy to remember. Uh, and we're going to kick things off with the large leafed aster. And I really love this species because uh, the previous place I used to live in had a Norway maple that was really difficult to grow anything under. And this plant was an absolute lifesaver for that spot. And I have since learned that it is also a really good grower under juglones or walnut species. Uh, so it can form quite a colony um, with different individuals flowering each year. Uh, if anybody's familiar with primroses, they do very similar things in sunny habitats where you can get quite a few primroses coming up, but not all of them will flower. The same thing happens with... Uh, with largely aster populations. Uh, so, you know, if you do end up with having an established patch in a few Can I be heard? Okay. My headset just... Okay. Um, so um, they are... In, in their colony form, they can be a little easy to miss if you're not familiar with their leaves. And uh, once you get used to, to, you know, seeing the large leaves of the large leaved aster, I think, you know, you familiarize yourself with them enough that you start seeing that they are quite a unique specimen that occurs within a particular habitat. And so when you're tending to your yard, you just want to make sure that, you know, in the large leaved aster area, you may have only seen a couple of plants actually flowering, but the actual colony uh, of, of the species might be spread a bit farther than that. So if you are doing any kind of, I don't know, weed removal or anything else, then you really want to be mindful of, of this plant in and around that spot. Um, and it is also uh, the larval host plant. And this is, this is one of those aspects of the story that you constantly, you know, keep learning. Um, I worked with Sam and Douglas for a while on, you know, uh, kind of getting all the information for curating these sheets uh, for this year. And, you know, I did not know that it is, uh, oh, what? Why did that move? PowerPoint. Uh, it, um, is the it is a host plant, not the host plant. It's not specific to this aster, but it it, it does apply to asters. Now I knew that the pearl crescent um, um, 
posted on a Heath Aster, but I thought it was just that, that specific Aster. Turns out it's all Asters, that's cool. Uh, but it is a larval host plant for these two species. Uh, once again, the, both images from caterpillars of Eastern North America. Uh, so if you happen to see a tiny black bug like this, or you know, uh, a wordy yellowish caterpillar like this, uh, don't freak out. You have just provided some crucial food for a couple of native butterfly species. Uh, next up is tall thimbleweed which gets its name from its fall uh, form, uh, which where its sort of little head floret looks like a thimble. Uh, and they actually do end up uh, having fluffy seed heads, kind of like a dandelion or a milkweed as well. However, it uh, usually occurs after the frost, which is a really fascinating sort of uh, adaptation within this plant uh, because that essentially means that their their seeds just go like right into the stratification pro or like the cold process, which is really interesting. Um, and the the plant does prefer somewhat rich, um, uh, you know, organic uh, rich in organic matter soils, and that that can apply to a lot of shade uh, tolerant species, but the the variation in shade tolerant species is that there are either species that do well in rich soils because they grow uh, in you know natural envir environments in the understory or along like you know wet edges or something like that, or they grow or they prefer like really bad and harsh soils because they grow on cliff edges or, you know, incredibly uh, craggy habitat like that. And so you have these sort of two different niches of plants that if you're bringing into your habitat, you know, you do have to recognize that, you know, if you're going to be planting uh, something more sensitive than this would be like wild ginger or cohosh, you know, these plants that really prefer old woodland soils you kind of have to try to replicate some of that environment in order for them to uh, establish. But I have seen thimbleweed kind of um, thrive in non-organic matter rich soil as well, but um, just kind of to keep in mind that, you know, if you start seeing the, the plant struggle or if the community is not growing, maybe add a little bit of organic matter to the soil around it and it will help around um, and it's surprisingly one of the few native plant species that grows pretty much across like the, the southern part of Canada and that and and most of uh, uh, of the U.S. as well, um, 38 of the 50 states. And that's quite rare um, because although we have many uh, genera that span that kind of um, uh, space and you know milkweed for example we have milkweed going all the way from here to down to mexico but by the time you're getting into the southern states the milkweed species are going from common to sort of like tropical and and you know just the species changes but thimbleweed pretty much remains anemone virginiana all across its range which is really fascinating uh and makes it a really good species to kind of recommend in in most garden spaces uh, and next up is white snake root, uh, a species that I really love, but don't have or have never had in my yard. And so I am uh, hopeful to uh, to have it established this year uh, because it really blooms very well into winter and even like after the first frost. Uh, and uh, it's, it's allegedly, it gets its name from... Uh, the indigenous people's use of it, of its roots to help cure or help people deal with snake bites. Uh, but I have not heard any confirmation of this from uh, anyone that I have spoken to that has any plant knowledge uh, from an Anishinaabeg or Haudenosaunee perspective. So I'm not sure what, uh, whose culture or what, what story that relates to, but, um, it is still a cool name and it can spread quite a bit as as a plant. And so 
it can be helpful to deadhead the flowers. And that just means, you know, cutting, cutting some of the flowers. So this is not one of those species like the large leaved aster that only certain individuals will bloom each year. Pretty much the entire patch will bloom every single year. And if you want to inhibit it from spreading too much uh, in the environment that you're planting it in, um, then you know you can you can cut some of the flowers once they've finished blooming, and and that'll make sure that it doesn't seed itself uh, and continue to spread. Uh, and it is a larval host plant to a whole bunch of moths, which is really cool. And one of the reasons that uh, you know I really like this plant is that. Um, one of the pollinator syndromes or connections between pollinator groups and, and plants is that moths don't particularly, they, they don't need to see color at night. Color is not that important, but everything else about a flower is a fragrance and landing area. And typically plants growing a little bit lower are preferred by certain species of moths. There are species that are known as like rug moths that literally, that pretty much remain on like the, the forest floor. And uh, one of the moth species that hosts on the white snake root is known as the climbing moth, which is this species right here. And it's, I think is a really, really beautiful moth. Uh, you would never uh, realize that this thing was uh, hosting there because it'll likely just be uh, it'll likely just be there uh, in in the evening or at night and then there will be a caterpillar that you may or may not recognize and then maybe one day this thing will emerge and you'll catch it uh, you know drying itself out before it takes off uh, but uh, one of those incredibly diverse species of moths uh, which we have, hundreds and thousands, uh, and yet, you know, we know very little about. And next up is yellow pimpernel, uh, which is a really incredibly delicate flower. Like, you know, golden alexanders look delicate, but then like you see yellow pimpernel flowers and you're like, is there even a flower there? Like what's going on? Uh, and the really cool thing about uh, this flower is once again, there are uh, many different species of halictid bees, so sweat bees and adrenid bees, uh, mining bees that uh, prefer um, yellow pimpernel to other species of flowers. They are short tongued bees, and so they're, they have, again, very much co evolved with these particular flower shapes in order to uh, benefit themselves and the flowers in the long term. Uh, and this is also a species that attracts beneficial insects to your yard. So one of those kind of rare examples where we have more knowledge about, uh, you know, non-pollinator species visiting a plant than we do pollinator species. And so there are braconid wasps, which are parasitic wasps that will essentially lay their eggs in the, the bodies of other species. Um, and often those end up being, you know, garden pest species that they can, they can help you control. Uh, it is also a host plant for the black swallowtail butterfly. Um, and, uh, it's, um, uh, it's, it can, it can be, um, sort of part shade to, to sun. Um, last year, I know this was in the, the sun kit in, in, in our uh, sale, but the variation on the kinds of environments that these things can grow in sort of differs. And so it, it has that variation, kind of like columbine can be sort of shade and kind of also sort of sun, but, it, you know, not full sun and maybe not full shade and yellow pimpernel kind of falls in that similar sort of category. And this is a, one of those plants that grows in poorer soils rather than organic matter rich soils because it's, its natural habitat is like dry upland prairies or eroded clay banks or, uh, you know, uh, bluffs. And so it really doesn't need any additional sort of amendments in the, in the soil for it to grow. And that's also partly why its flowers are so incredibly delicate. When you're growing in such a nutrient deficient environment, the kinds of flowers that you eventually develop are going to be 
you know, not as fragrant, not as, uh, not, not as abundant. And uh, you'll end up needing some very specialized bees to help you get your job done. And last but not least in the shade kit is Zigzag Goldenrod uh, Solidago flexicalis. Uh, I really love this species because it is a late season, like just magnet for all kinds of beneficial wasps, insects, uh, and native bees. And this is true for most goldenrod species, but um, people will often be familiar with goldenrods in sunny environments. This is a really cool goldenrod because it grows in the shade. Uh, and also really uh, great because if you combine this with your large leaved aster and put it under uh, a black walnut or a Norway maple, you've got yourself a pretty bumping habitat that you don't really have to worry about, uh, you know, uh, sort of managing year on year because both of these species uh, and zigzag goldenrod, um, perhaps a little bit more so than, than largely vaster, don't spread very rapidly. Zigzag goldenrod will develop a population over time, but it's, it's not as uh, vociferous a grower as Canada goldenrod or other goldenrod species that, that you might be familiar with. Um, and so uh, it is also a host plant to at least 11 known species of moths and um, probably more that we don't know about. And uh, one of the coolest things that I know about this plant is, uh, is its relationship to Anishinaabe like uh, ethnobotany. Uh, and that is that in um, certain medicinal uses, the way that goldenrods are distinguished are by their flower structure. And so either globe-headed flowers or kind of like pinnate or lance-headed flowers. And so zigzag goldenrod is one of the goldenrods that gets used in specific medicines because of its globe-headed flower form. Uh, and that, I think is super cool because it's one of this, those, again, myriad stories that connect us to the hundreds of species of plants that are all around us. Uh, and so this is just a small sampling. This is 11 species. I talked about them for an hour. It's 11 species, okay? There are hundreds of these species and each of them have so many more connections and stories and hosts and, and play hosts to, to so many more species. Uh, and you know, our, our hope is to encourage everybody to go out and learn about as many of them as possible. Uh, and there are uh, other sources to get plants if you, know, you didn't get all the species you wanted from Project Swallowtail. Um, uh, Sharon Lovett over at High Park Nature curated a really wonderful list of all the different native plant sales that are going to be happening in Toronto. And so I will share that with everybody in a follow-up newsletter. Um, you can see it here as well. Carolina in Canada, WWF Canada uh, have partnered with Loblaws once again. So there will be lots of native plants available at 123 locations. Uh, NAMPS is doing a plant sale, um, the Toronto Botanical Gardens. Uh, so there will be more opportunities to get plants. Uh, and last but not least, um, our Seed Sitters Project in Project Swallowtail is, I mean, at least for me, I seeded 12 trays of native plants and I am starting to see a whole bunch of heath aster come up and a whole bunch of, uh, well, maybe not as much, but still a bunch, uh, still a bunch of large leaf aster starting to, or heart leaf aster, sorry, starting to come up. Um, so our, our hope is to really nourish these kind of long-term relationships with these plants through our little seed sitter group and in future years be able to support Project Swallowtail kind of community gardens and projects through seed sitter plants. So kind of having, you know, two modes of the project, one that creates habitat and one that sort of provides the plants for that habitat creation. Um, and so with that, I will uh, stop talking and open up the floor for some questions. Sam, thanks for being here. Are there any questions? Have you seen any? Oh, there we go. Are the plants? Hi, everyone. Yeah. 
for the community gardens at a special price for community gardens or are they for donations to the community? Uh, so the webinar and well, technically it, it goes till 745. Uh, that's probably an easier question to answer. Uh, technically it goes to 745, but if we don't have too many questions, we can end earlier. Um, uh, plants on the table for community garden at a special price for community garden? No, yeah, they are. So uh, if this question is about um, the planted forward kits, Sharon, um, then those kits that have been purchased by other Swallowtail members or Pollen ATO participants um, are going to be donated to, to community groups. So we won't be asking them for a donation towards it because uh, somebody else has already graciously donated on their behalf, essentially. Um, so our hope is that in future years, we don't have to rely on people having to, to buy plants, but that we can provide a lot of that interconnection through the, through the project. Uh, you're trying to winter, so, oh, cool, Suzanne, that's nice. Uh, yeah, I, I. So I learned most about white um, about white snake root from uh, Lorraine Johnson, and she seems to have had quite a bit of success with the species in like pretty much any way. Uh, single species tray sales in future years versus kits. Um, that's a great question, Deborah. Uh, any thought to selling single species trays? Uh, so. This might be a possibility again through um, seed sitters because most sitters are growing like two or three species. And so it is a lot easier for us to provide people with just like trays of plants. And yeah, there is something to be said about, you know, changing the, the possible model of the plant sales into the future because the intent of the kits was to provide people who had, you know, little to no experience with poly creating pollinator habitat, a free, free chosen <laughs> pollinator garden, essentially, where they could just go home, plant all these plants and know that they had enough bloom uh, throughout the different seasons to, to make sure that, you know, pollinators of as many different types and sorts were uh, supported. But, you know, maybe the project is now at the stage where people are, you know, quite familiar with the native plants and they just want to select, you know, specific species. And so for that kind of thing, we might partner or, or discuss partnerships with like, you know, the Toronto native plant market or other other growers like that. But yeah, that's a that's a good call. Uh, heard about prairie smoke being almost as mean that we should be promoting this plants especially. Uh, yeah, well, sure. <laughs> there are so many species of plants, you know, uh, that are uh, really struggling across most of their native range. I mean, think about the habitat that, you know, prairie smoke would grow in like there there aren't that many you know open grassland intact habitats <laughs> in southern Ontario where this plant would just be like naturally occurring um but this is also the case for you know uh the the large leaved ass well you could probably find it in in some you know older forests if you went to like provincial parks and stuff but again most parks won't just have you know large leaved aster um easily growing, uh, but prairie smoke has has even a, a lower rate of, of existing across. There's a similar thing to like columbine, you know, uh, you might see a lot of cultivars of columbine around, but, you know, you won't come across many wild ecotypes of columbine in, in your local park or something like that. So uh, the 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 almost endangered is is that the it the plant has stable populations like it's not a concern 
uh, like a conservation concern overall, but across Southern Ontario uh, in, uh, in most of its historical habitat, and the plant has like declined a, a huge amount. Um, and promoting the plant uh, is, yeah, super great. It is a plant that also is a little, uh, is a little more nuanced in its soil preferences. So, you know, it really likes kind of sandy-ish loose soil. Um, I, you know, a lot of sort of Southwest Toronto backyards have like very clay heavy soil and uh, it may not really work as a species for a lot of gardens in that way. And it really does like really, really like sun. And so again, it was a species that, you know, may not be feasible for a lot of folks on like balconies and things like that. But it is definitely a species that anybody who has a garden that has a sunny spot should 100% get prairie smoke uh, because it is beautiful and it's just, uh, I think even the leaves just like look really, really gorgeous all year round. Um, offer both options. Yeah, that's a great, that's a really great idea and consideration, Debra. We'll, uh, uh, we'll see what, what form the plant sale takes next year um, and go from there. Uh, I want to contact NAMS. Take a left of our plants. Oh yeah. Oh, sorry. Okay, that's another comment. Thank you. Uh, if there are any other questions, please feel free to. Uh, can all the sun plants be grown in? Oh yeah. Uh, can all the sun plants be grown in large containers? Yes. Um, we suggest. Um. And again, we can share this in a, in a follow-up email too, maybe highlighting some sort of balcony gardening tips because we had a webinar on that last year, which I think is probably a good thing to, to refresh on. Um, but uh, yeah, if you have a large enough container, um, I suggest, and you know, our partners at WWF suggest the root pouches. Um, and we can... Um, uh, we can share the link for, for purchasing those. But if you have a large enough um, container in which the roots can overwinter, um, yeah, pretty much every plant in there in the sun kit can, can grow in that. Um, I don't know what will replace the goldenrod. Um, goldenrods are pretty, pretty happy in most circumstances. Uh, although Canada goldenrod weirdly is one of those species that like doesn't like, you know, I've seen it grow in like bigger containers, like uh, planter boxes and things, but you know, not not um, root patches. Uh, but prairie smoke, for example, I only have in a container because the the time that I tried planting it in the ground, it got completely overrun by by the by really just like coneflower and sneezeweed that I had planted around it. Like they just they took off. It was, yeah, as well. So. Uh, I have it in in a container just to sort of it's it's kind of a, a showcase plant I guess in a way uh, because with all of the other things that I'm doing in in the yard it's uh, I don't want it to get lost. Uh, oh, that's cool. The prairie smoke we got from you last year is now in bloom. Ah, oh, that's awesome. Thanks for sharing that, Connie. Appreciate it. Uh, if there are no other questions, um, please feel free to toss them in the Q&A. But if not, um, thank you for, for being here, everyone. Really appreciate it. I am excited to, to see most of you, if not many of you, um, at the at the plant sale in person, uh, May twenty eighth, and yeah, if you have any other questions and stuff, please feel free to reach out to us at admin at projectswallowtail.ca. Thanks, everybody. See you later. <laughs>